Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Detlef Sprenz, a senior scientist with the research domain Transdisciplinary Concepts and Methods at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany. He is currently at Yale as a Rice Faculty Fellow in the European Studies Council at the Macmillan Center and a visiting professor in the Department of Political Science and at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Today we'll talk with Professor Sprenz about the effectiveness of climate clubs. Welcome Professor Sprenz. Well, thank you for inviting me. Let's start with the term climate club. It's not something that I'm familiar with. So explain what a club is and, and perhaps why a club is used in terms of a, of a country. Well, let's locate it properly. Uh, the climate club refer, uh, refers to climate mitigation and okay. incentives to do so. It's not about adaptation, meaning coping with the effects like any of the hurricanes, or compensation, meaning dealing with whatever isn't being mitigated in damages or adapted to. So let's go to climate mitigation clubs. Okay. If we mitigate, we create worldwide global public goods. That is, anybody benefits from the emissions never emitted, mm -hmm. meaning avoided damages. That sometimes and quite often may not be enough to give incentives for countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So if they have additional effects, uh, additional benefits, I should say, um, like a club good, and I will explain this, this good would give them additional impetus to join um, a group of other countries to do the same. Think of a tennis club. You normally want to play tennis, there is a tennis ground, but there is normally a lot of demand. And so they normally put a fence around, a sign-up sheet, and ask you for a membership fee. Mm -hmm. Here it's the same. But in return for paying all of that, in this case uh, spending 1% of GDP on mitigation per year, you get additional trade benefits that are only for members and not for non-members. Mm -hmm. So it's members only benefits. Okay. And let's talk about the, the, that term in reality. So in terms of you know, what countries belong to these clubs? Well, first of all, in reality, many informal networks call themselves climate clubs. Okay. They're mostly talk shops okay. and maybe coordination clubs for some, let's say, research and development at mm -hmm. very, very best. So we build on the literature and a proposition by David Victor of the University of California at San Diego. He suggested that we build incentive structures from the bottom up mm -hmm. for countries to undertake something together, but we are not, so to speak, uh, only charitable. We think about countries as essentially looking after their own welfare. Right. So in that sense, the clubs are an idea, the climate clubs are an idea to reconcile global public benefits with incentives for countries. Okay. And what are some of the incentives typically? The incentives are typically to generate welfare that hopefully spreads widely in the country in order to generate uh, political support. So preferential trade access is one of those. Mm -hmm. In previous government and actually also as I hear in the, pref uh, in the current government. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how, what conditions um, would a climate club um, emerge and grow? Well, we look at a range of factors, and all of this are agent-based model, meaning computational models that calibrate in, in a non-arbitrary way where a country stands and what might happen uh, if it relates to others in a specific way. So, what are the incentives? For one, we know what it costs them to mitigate mm -hmm. in a simplified way. Uh, and, and I'm they, sorry, what do you mean by mitigate? Mitigate is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. And they can take essentially three different roles. They're a leader, meaning they are the front runners alone or another big emitter. And the three ones we look at are the US, China, and the European Union of 28. Okay. And whether they go alone or with any of the others, these are the starting configurations. And they look at are they in the end themselves better off joining a club and staying a club, meaning do followers emerge? And if they are better off uh, with the club than without, they will stay in. Mm -hmm. The other role is they could be followers, meaning not one of those three, potential threes. And in that case, these countries only look, am I better off joining or not? 
Not that the group of all is better, but am I better off mm -hmm. joining or not? And the third role that they potentially take is abstainers or outsiders, meaning I don't want to have to do anything with this, mm -hmm. and I just stay outside. Okay. Um, let's talk about the, the second two groups you mentioned, not the leaders, mm -hmm. but the people who are, uh, the countries who are abstaining or um, are considering whether to join or not. Let's start with the abstainers. What countries have you looked at that that have said, you know, I have no interest in being a part of this or it's not worthwhile for our country to participate? Abstainers? Well, there's only one famous case. It's the uh, Trump speech in the Rose Garden on June the 1st of this year in 2017, uh, where he announced he wants to leave the Paris Agreement. We did not model exactly the Paris Agreement. We started modeling already in November, December of mm -hmm. last year, after we heard who was elected and what does it mean if one of the big players is potentially leaving the role as a leader. Mm -hmm. So we looked at it, what happens if the U.S. becomes a follower? Right. And third one, if it becomes an outsider, it does want to stay outside. If it wants to stay outside, and we could do this also if uh, uh, the EU wants to choose this role or if uh, China would choose this role, but we have only done it so far for the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the results are roughly as this. It becomes somewhat more difficult to build a credible uh, climate mitigation club uh, that doesn't preclude, like, say, a coalition of the EU and China to emerge, but anything where the U.S. would be the leader is, of course, now omitted from the uh, choice set. The level at which a club would grow now necessitates normally higher club good benefits to compensate for the loss of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And of course, under, certain, under a whole range of configurations, the U.S. is now missing, meaning roughly 14 percentage points of uh, emissions are missing under many configurations. On a few occasions, if there is an abstainer like the U.S. could be, then a few others may follow like Brazil and other medium-sized countries, but also sometimes means then that India comes in, which is the fourth biggest emitter. Okay. So it is not that the U.S. can overcome the incentives other countries have, but certainly it will be missed. Okay. And you look at two conceptual approaches to the study of climate policy um, of major countries, interest-based, um, and then also, um, which is augmented by the, the domestic political situation there. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that, um, particularly um, perhaps China and the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, what is the interest-based explanation? It's an incredibly simple classification system, and it looks at two factors. Okay. How ecologically vulnerable am I, for instance, to climate change? And second is, what are the costs of mitigation? And if you have low mitigation costs and high ecological vulnerability, you will most likely be a pusher in international negotiations. If you have high costs and low environmental benefits for whatever you do, obviously you are likely to be a dragger. Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, some in-between categories. So we ran for the six major countries of the world. We ran models and looked at data to classify countries. And we predicted that, for instance, China is a dragger and that uh, actually there would be no pusher. Then we compared it to the actual diplomatic record. And of course, we found that there are few errors in our predictions. Mm -hmm. But that highlighted why domestic politics is so important, mm -hmm. because it's a, mac it's a modifier of these macro quantitative kind of simple classification system. So we look at popularity of climate change policies in a country. We looked at their uh, industries that may uh, benefit from renewable energy mm -hmm. or their own exports of renewable energy providers. Say, think of China. China has flooded the market with photovoltaic equipment. So it's not only that German producers go out of business, but even Indian producers go out of business because China has just achieve such a huge scale of production that their per unit costs are very, very low. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you find even states in the U.S. that are uh, very enthusiastic uh, about some sort of climate policy or let's call them renewable energy portfolios. Mm -hmm. So for some time, uh, Texas is a leading country, uh, state, excuse me, 
it has rolled out uh, renewable energy on a scale that took everything, everybody else by breath. Mm -hmm. And so we have it also in part on the east and on the west coast, depending on which state it is. Of course, there's a California effect. Um, in general, the U.S. position of being a kind of intermediate enthusiasm was not correct under Obama too, meaning especially his activities in his last four years. He was certainly, the country was a leader in international negotiations, right. although it started already in 2009 with trying to engage China and then under Secretary Kerry, who is here now on campus, it of course was uh, even enhanced further. But if we look at the Trump administration, the hesitations are more than obvious. So mm -hmm. it certainly is not a leader on the global scale anymore. This begs the question, what is about China? When Trump made his announcement on June 1st of this year, China responded it sticks by its obligations. And since it's the biggest emitter in the world of greenhouse gases, mm -hmm. um, we have to see if the EU and China will do something together and if they are by default the remaining leaders. Mm -hmm. Do you think India will step up to the plate? This is an extremely good question. It was hesitant uh, until Paris. And if I'm not mistaken, the U.S. did a behind-the-scenes deal in order to get in India uh, on renewable energy, which uh, India is passionate about, not because they necessarily like, at least on the international scale, uh, climate change protection to an extremely high extent, but they need energy. Mm -hmm. They are fastly growing. They have huge intermittences if, uh, that you will find any time you do a Skype conversation with India and the generators go on because intermittency comes in. And also, if you live there, and I have lived there, you have always protection against intermittency. But they like any source of reliable energy. However, India has public tenders for photovoltaics, but especially wind, that are of such a low price that you wonder how they do it. Uh, it may be that they do not always follow through the investors on their promises, but the prices are so attractive that renewables clearly beats coal in new installations. And what about solar energy? I mean, in this country, I think there's a huge push for solar energy. Um, do you think that will have an effect moving forward on how countries work together? Well, I don't know exactly the production costs here and how, if you mm -hmm. protect yourself against the imports of Chinese panels. And then there's concentrated solar where you have lots of experimental sites in mm -hmm. some of the deserts here, which are, of course, uh, very important. Uh, with panels, um, the prices have come so much down over the last 10 years that uh, if one looks at the price level and solves the intermittency problem, I mean the problem of if there is no wind, in this case for wind power, or no sun for sun power, you need some sort of buffer in between. Mm -hmm. But once you solve that, I think uh, even for the U.S., it's um, looking at renewables is not a net cost, but in the long run, a net benefit. Mm -hmm. It also saves you a little bit on your transmission lines. You don't have really a nationally integrated grid. So these sources of energy are decentralized. That helps with the current uh, installations quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you think the, in, the U.S. can influence the effectiveness of climate clubs? And if so, how best to do that? Well, in some sense, the Trump government has decided to abstain. So in that sense, it makes it for the rest of the world more difficult because the leader is missing. Right. And, of course, everybody recognizes it. However, if the U.S. would go domestic and alone and would, so to speak, say, we want to now be the real competitors of the Chinese because we roll out a domestic program, there's no reason not to believe that American entrepreneurialism, both on the business case side as well as on the technology side, could not be a very viable competitor. In fact, that would be nice to see. Mm -hmm. Because uh, why shouldn't there be a competition for um, charitable and profitable ends. Right, right. So what do you see for the future of uh, climate clubs being? I mean, do you think there will be more of them created or do you think less? Well, given the, what the Trump uh, this, uh, administration decided in the middle of this year, it of course makes it more difficult mm -hmm. as compared to an Obama too.
Uh, I think one shouldn't be pessimistic. I think the rest of the world, at least some of the major players, will not try to be in, uh, discouraged. And there's, of course, the question, what generates the wealth of tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Is it coal, iron, and steel? Or is it renewable energy uh, and these types of technologies? Um, and I think the bet is on the latter, not on the former. Mm -hmm. And to your point, to that point, I think even if the United States is becomes more of a follower and not a leader, I think perhaps the rest of the world, in terms of the people in those countries, to your point about um, domestic politics, can rise up and have renewable sources of energy become more p prominent part of the roles that they play in the countries? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, this country is a federal state. Mm -hmm. And that means some parts of the country are much more ambitious on climate policies than the federal government is. True. And if you look at the East Coast and the West Coast and the related uh, Canadian provinces, there's much more enthusiasm mm -hmm. than in other parts of this country and in, on Capitol Hill. Right. Uh, so in that sense, there's no reason to be discouraged. So when I was living in Missoula, Montana, you could buy at Whole Foods literally uh, a share of a re renewable energy plan mm -hmm. and thereby support it. It was just, you go to the checkout and you do it in a minor way. And actually the community of, or the, the city government of uh, Missoula, Montana even offered you public recognition for it if you wanted so by putting you on a nice web page. Mm -hmm. So as a climate pioneer. So California tries to do its policy and uh, Governor Brown was here recently in town and clearly positioned himself so did the governor of the state of Washington uh, and there are others. So there's no reason to despair about the US because there's also a lot of entrepreneurialism and the only thing that a European should really fear in terms of competition is that the Americans have the better business models. Mm -hmm. Because Europe is mostly state-led or a heavy reliance on the role of the state. Here, most likely in the US, it will be more in the business sector with, of course, some framework uh, laws by uh, the federal and the state governments. But good entrepreneurialism cannot be substituted for, and there's a lot of this in this mm -hmm. country. Ultimately, do you think the climate clubs will be able to reduce emissions? Well, first of all, or what mitigate. we have is, is our model results. <laughs> uh -huh. So ultimately, if we want to see if they really emerge, we would have to wait in history. Right. But I would have to become very old to do a proper evaluation. But as a scientist, that's really what uh, patience is called for. But what, the, what is the real value of this model is to show the enduring incentives. Mm -hmm. However, we have also configuration when they die. So it's not that this is morally or um, driven by hope. These are numerical results based on real input data as we get them from the World Bank, from the University of Notre Dame, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, so the hope is there, but there are no assurances. But there's one thing, climate change, especially anthropogenically influenced climate change, is extremely unlikely to go away. So even if we don't mitigate, we do have an adaptation issue. Mm -hmm. And as Houston has shown, uh, compared to the Caribbean islands, the damages are severe, but by far not as severe in, as in many of the Caribbean uh, countries. So right. these parts of the US are much better shielded. Economic development helps. And whether you believe or not believe in climate change, all of Florida, Louisiana, and Texas will think hard about what to do. So when I gave a presentation in Alaska, I think it was in 2011, I saw members of the US Navy showing up in uniform, speaking on climate change under George W. Bush. Excuse me, it was, after, it was Obama. I think it was still during the time of Bush, so I may be mistaken for the year. But this person stood up and said, we don't care whether this is uh, man-made or non-man-made. We have to plan for our ports. If there is sea level rise, you know, we have a management problem. If sure. we lose our ports, and this is our sea power. Mm -hmm. So taking it into account, in, into account for our planning of the future infrastructure is just good professional management. And so I take uh, that as good evidence that people think very sober about what they have to do in the future, and especially if they build long-term infrastructure the incentives are there to, to think far ahead. Right, especially um, 
just with the recent hurricanes that have been happening. I think more and more people, it's becoming more and more an issue. So important work. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much. For more information about Professor Sprintz and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.